Hey, can everybody hear me? This is Ben Ruddle. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this winter cyber seminar. Uh, I'm hosting it. I am on the faculty at Northern Arizona University. That's in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, where I'm on the informatics faculty. And I'm directing uh, the NSF funded and USDA funded fusion project. That's a mesoscale uh, mapping project for the U.S. food, energy, and water supply chain. And we have a website, which is fusion.us, F-E-W-S-I-O-N.us. And you can go there to read more about the project and, and what's going on, see the papers, etc. So I want to thank Kawasi for hosting this. I think it's a fantastic service to the community uh, to provide these cyber seminars. And it's a great chance for us to hear about what's going on uh, currently in the field. So thanks for the opportunity to do this. We're going to be uh, spending about 45 to 50 minutes on this topic. Um, and then the Kawasi moderators will uh, be able to take that over and, and, and transition uh, afterwards. Um, you will see that if, if you're in the online interface, you'll see that you have the ability to type in questions, and we'll be able to field those questions. Um, our speaker today is Megan Konar. She's on the faculty in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is a co-PI on Fusion, and she has been leading some of the work related to networks, and in particular to the importance of food commodity flows in the U.S. economy. So uh, she has actually asked that she be able to field questions in real time, and so she may be doing that. Go ahead and ask, and she'll she'll stop the talk and, and answer questions if she feels like it's appropriate, and otherwise it'll wait till the end. Um, the title of the talk today is Food Flows Between Counties in the United States, and this is an important layer within the data set that we're developing. So it's really foundational and, and good to take a look at what Megan and her lab's been doing. Um, with no further delay, I'll turn it over to Megan. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. All right. Thanks, Ben. So yeah, today I wanted to tell you about some work I'm doing as part of this NSF Infuse project where Ben is the PI at NAU. Um, and so this um, talk is one of, a, of several talks in this winter cyber seminar series, and we're all working together to basically map and model the food energy water system in the US. And I've been focusing a lot on the food component of that. Um, so today I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, basically what we've been doing to try to model food flows between counties in the US. Um, and I'm happy to take clarifying questions as I go. It's a bit of a, if I, if I see them, this interface is a little bit busy, but um, I'll try to answer those as I go, and otherwise definitely can, can take some time to answer questions at the end. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Megan Konar, and I'm in Civil and Environmental Engineering at um, University of Illinois. And let's get started. Okay, so the talk today is really based on three papers. And so this is pretty much the foundation of one of my student, Zhao and Lin's um, dissertation. So he's been working for a couple years to understand basically the network properties of food flows. So he started out looking at um, data in the US, so trying to basically characterize the network statistics of food flows within the US. And so here you'll see this is based on government data, freely available government data, but it is at a pretty coarse spatial resolution. And the most of the work that we're doing in this talk is basically trying to bring that freely available government data down to uh, the county scale. So it's a downscaling challenge, really. Uh, but it's a pretty complex downscaling challenge. And um, this talk also um, builds on some other work where we look at food flow networks at, at other spatial scales. So we compare the network properties of uh, food flows in the US to those of global food trade, as well as food exchanges within a few villages in Alaska. And so those two papers kind of lay the foundation for the modeling that we do in uh, paper three, which is the focus of this talk. Basically, how do we model food flows between counties in the US? 
So that's basically the goal. The goal of this talk and the goal of this paper is to model or estimate food flows between all counties in the US. So first I just wanted to start off, you know, why do we even want to do this? So this is a, a pretty complex modeling exercise. So, um, but we want to do it because for two main reasons, uh, because these spatially detailed food flows will improve our understanding of our food supply chain in the US. Um, once we have a more refined understanding of where food is moving around our country, we can better determine you know, where it's vulnerable to potential disruptions. We can figure out um, if it's resilient in certain places. We can see what infrastructure is really critical to supporting our food flows in this country. Um, so just looking at the food infrastructure itself, um, it's really important to look at this finer spatial detail. I mean, this, is, this will be pretty rare because we do have a lot of really good data on food supply chains, food trade, but that tends to be very coarse in spatial resolution. It's typically at the, you know, between countries. So this would be a very detailed spatial mapping of uh, food flows within one country. Um, so then it would also be really helpful to have this detailed spatial mapping because that would help us improve our understanding of the resources that are embodied in, in the food supply chain. So a lot of other talks in this sub, uh, cyber seminar series are focused on doing that. So trying to figure out, uh, because we know that agriculture and the food system is really a dominant user of our natural resources. It's uh, the main consumptive user of water within the US and globally. It uh, emits a lot of carbon. Uh, there's a lot of nutrients embodied in agricultural production and food trade. Um, last week, um, Professor Chris Lant talked about the human appropriation of net primary productivity that's embodied in agriculture. So all these things are, we think of them as resource footprints of agriculture and food. And in order to more accurately trace those through the food supply chain, we basically need to know where the food is originating and where it's going to. So those are the two main motivations for, for this work. So first I wanted to share with you some um, empirical insights from the first two papers that are relevant for the modeling that we're doing here. So this is from uh, Lynn et al. 2014. So this is where we're just looking at the network properties of um, the food flow network in the US at the state spatial scale, state or sometimes the FAF spatial scale. And you'll hear a lot of, of that word FAF. So FAF is basically the US government, the name of the US government database that provides information on commodity movements within the US. It stands for Freight Analysis Framework. And it provides information on these commodity flows between 132 spatial units in the US. Um, and I'll have a map of that um, in a few slides from now. But essentially it's states and some major cities within those states. So that's where we have information on where food, not only food, but all commodities in the US is moving between. And so here, when we look here, this is a circos mapping of that database. And here, the way you read this is you can basically look at the outer arcs. And for example, you see that largest outer arc is in the top and it's red and that refers to Illinois. And so any link emanating from that arc, which is red, shows Illinois um, kind of sending out food to other states. So you can see the biggest link is actually going from Illinois to Louisiana. And there's a white space that's separating the outer arc for Louisiana to that link. So you can see that's Illinois sending food to Louisiana. And so that makes sense because Illinois is a big, has a big um, train network and it's a huge producer of grains. So it makes sense that they would be sending a lot of food to Louisiana, which has one of the largest ports in the US, the port of New Orleans. And so here we can just get some kind of basic understanding of how food is moving around the US. We see that Midwestern states are key exporters to harbors throughout the US. We see that there's a lot of connections. Pretty much all states are connected with each other. Um, and we can see that there are other states like California both sends out a lot of food and takes in a lot of food. Um, Iowa is another really important state sending out mostly a lot of food. Um, so you can, and these arcs are all ranked in descending order in terms of the mass flux of food that each state participates in. So this is um, one kind of larger scale representation that we want to maintain when we model these food flows at, at the county scale. Um, also, um, from this work, we looked at some network properties. So here I'm plotting um, B versus K 
in graph A. So B is between the centrality and K is no degree. Um, so no degree just simply refers to the number of trade partners that you have. So it's just a, a binary counting variable. Um, and between the centrality looks at the number of shortest paths that pass through um, each node as a fraction of all um, paths in that network. And so you can see there's some interesting relationships. So there's a power law relationship between the betweenness of each um, node in the US food flow network and its, and its connectivity structure. So that just means as a state increases how many connections it has, it dramatically increases its centrality or its importance. So between the centrality is often thought of as a measure of importance in a network. So as states connect to other states, they become much more central and important to the network. Um, and then if you look at it, it in graph B, so here it's not in log log anymore, but you can see this um, kind of set of outliers in the top right of that graph. And that's what's referred to as a core in, uh, in a network. So that's really just showing that there's a handful, here it's about eight states and um, cities that are really critical. These are the core or the backbone of the food flow network in the US. And so these are states that, and cities that have a high betweenness and also um, high connectivity. And so they're really kind of outliers. And these are things, these are places like um, Long Beach in California, Iowa, um, so some of the major ports and some of the key states are core to our network. So we basically want to be able to make sure that we can re represent this in our model of, of county food flows. Um, so after that paper, so that was just looking at the network structure of food flows in the U.S., we were curious to see how, how those network properties compared to other um, networks of food flows that exist. So in a, a paper last year, we basically compare the network properties of global food trade. So there's a mapping of that in A um, with B. So that's, those are the network properties I showed you just now. So the freight analysis framework data for the US. And then we also collected, um, we also, we also um, used some information that exists on food sharing in three Alaskan villages. And that is from a paper by Baggio et al. and PNAS in 2016, I believe. So we collected empirical information on food flows at three dramatically different spatial scales and then looked at their network properties to see is there any consistency? And if so, is that something that we can use when we're estimating food flows at other scales that we don't have data for? So pretty remarkably, we did find that there is a lot of similarity in the structural properties of food flows at all these spatial scales. So here I'm showing you um, statistical distributions, basically of um, the node degree or the connectivity. It's also sometimes called topology. So that's in the first column. So there you can see the histogram of node degree at the global spatial scale in A, um, at the US spatial scale in D, and the village spatial, spatial scale in G. And so there, the hatched boxes all show the data. And then the black line is a generalized exponential distribution that's been fit to the data. And that distribution fits the data well, um, even though we're talking about remarkably different, um, remarkably different patterns, and, or sorry, remarkably different scales, you know, global all the way to village scale. And then you can see the same thing in the middle column. So there, I'm plotting the histogram of mass flux. So now you have the trade links, but they're being weighted by the mass of the food that's being transmitted on each trade link. And so B shows the mass flux distribution for global trade, global food trade. Um, e shows the mass flux distribution for mass flux in the US and H shows the mass flux distribution for food at the village spatial scale. And then the black line again is a uh, Probab uh, probability distribution fit to the data. And here it's the gamma distribution that we fit to the data. And the gamma distribution actually um, remarkably fits the mass flux distribution across these three dramatically different spatial scales. And then in the last column, we're looking at the relationship between strength um, or mass flux and degree or the topology of the network. So basically here it's showing, um, this is a log log plot. And so as you increase your connections, the number of nodes that you're connected to, you dramatically increase, you supralinearly increase the mass flux that you transmit 
um, in the network. And so these patterns were, were consistent across all these spatial scales. So then we thought, well, if we know this, then we can pretty much expect that a, a food flow network at any spatial scale should follow these properties since these appear to be so ubiquitous. And especially if we want to model them for the county spatial scale, because the county spatial scale is in between the village and the US spatial scale. So we feel pretty confident that our county spatial scale should have similar network properties. And that's one of the main um, things that we want to force our model to, to achieve. So basically, the, our main approach for modeling county food flows is to build on the empirical, infer, empirical insights that we gained looking at data on food flows at other spatial scales. Um, and then also, our approach is to downscale the data that we do have. So we do have this FAF transfer data. And so here's a map of it. In the top, you can see a map of the US, and there's 132 spatial units. So um, like I mentioned, it's pretty much all states with uh, a few kind of large city areas called MSAs, uh, municipal statistical areas highlighted in green. And so this data provides uh, commodity flows basically between all pairs of these 132 spatial units. And the most recent data available is for 2012. So we um, are estimating corresponding county flows for the same year. So our county flow um, model is also for the year 2012. And so the freight analysis framework provides commodity flows for st the standard classification of transported goods or SETG commodities. So although it is fairly refined in terms of our spatial understanding of food flows, it's less refined in terms of our commodity categorization. So for example, international trade tells you very um, commodity specific details about commodities that are being traded, you know, various types of corn, specific types of rice, um, basmati rice, short grain rice, you know, very detailed and the types of commodities being traded in international trade databases. Um, but conversely, here we have a higher spatial resolution, but we have a coarser commodity categorization. So here we're restricted basically to those SETG commodity categories. And there's um, uh, seven that are um, related to food. And so they're pretty broad. So now we're dealing with things like um, cereal groups rather than maize. So we're talking now about food movements and we're specifically modeling um, food movements of these seven broad food, food commodities. And so here the goal is to basically move from this FAF database, which we have 132 spatial units down to this county spatial resolution here, where there's uh, over, over 3,100 counties in the US or, or county equivalents. So it is a downscaling challenge, but it is actually a pretty complex downscaling challenge. So you can see here in the schematic on the left, um, typical downscaling might be moving from this blue box um, down to smaller spatial units within that blue box. So you have some value for this blue box and you wanna then get a value for you know, the blue, green, yellow, and purple boxes. Um, that's um, a lot of spatial downscaling, moving from a coarse grid to a finer mesh. But here, we need to downscale flows. So in the, the right, I've present, provided a schematic of that. So we're taking data on flow from you know, one big blue box to another big blue box and we wanna downscale it to smaller entities within those kind of bigger um, states. So now we basically wanna model, you know, how much food is going from the little blue box to the little blue box, from the little blue box to the yellow box, from the little blue box to the green, and, and the little blue box to the purple, and so on. So you have many more combinations and pairs that occur when you're trying to model links between smaller entities. Um, so we have to model all of these links. And so in fact, the complexity and the number of entities that we have to estimate scales with n times n minus one, um, that's because we're trying to model the number of directed paths in the network. And so the number of pairs in a directed network um, is n times n minus one. So for dealing with um, counties, we had a little over 3,100. So that means that n times n minus one, we're getting roughly 9.5 million county pairs that we need to estimate. And that's for each SETG commodity class. So we have to do this seven times. So that is roughly um, 70 million unique entities that we're trying to estimate with this model. 
Okay, so how do we do this? So, so we've developed a, a modeling approach that uh, takes a combination of, of approaches. So first, so it uses supervised learning, linear programming, mass balance, and network properties. So we knew we wanted to combine all these features because um, uh, we wanted to basically add the realism that we understand exists in other food flow networks. So we wanted to have the same network properties as we saw in those other spatial scales. So that is a, a main approach. I think it's the main novelty in, in our approach that we're using here. So we're constraining our county scale food flows to have the same um, network properties that we saw in other empirical networks, um, mass balance. So we're also making sure that all the counties that we estimate within one FAF zone add up to the FAF data. So basically if there was, um, for the state of Illinois, say there's 100 counties within it, we wanna make sure that those 100 counties add up to the FAF data that they are contained within. So we have some data to guide us. It's really just a matter of disaggregating within those smaller units. Um, linear programming, so we do um, also want to make sure that our estimates are going to be more reasonable, and by that we mostly think that you're going to be more likely to trade between counties if they're closer together, and that's because it's going to, um, we think of, there's going to be a cost to transmit food longer distances, so we use a linear programming algorithm to basically uh, prioritize sending food at shorter distances. And then we use supervised learning. So here, this is a type of machine learning where we basically um, take the FAF data that we have and we um, have a supervised learning approach where we fit a model to half of the data. So half of the link level FAF data. And we uh, run various regressions with supervised learning and figure out which um, functional form best fits the FAF data. So that's what we get from supervised learning. And then we basically apply that to the county spatial scale. And so the type of supervised learning that we run is a gamma mixture hurdle model. And what that basically means is we first run a logistic regression. So here we want to model the process that determines if a link exists or not. So a logistic regression is a regression that tells you um, ones or zeros. So we first um, try to figure out the attributes that drive a link forming in the first place. And then conditional on the link forming, we want to force it to have that same gamma uh, mass flux distribution that we saw at other spatial scales. So then we use a gamma regression model to um, model the mass flux along each link in our network. So those are, so that is how that works. So that was a schematic of our algorithm. So here's kind of it broken out into three main steps. So first, we run that supervised learning algorithm. So we train a supervised learning or a machine learning model on the existing FAF data. So there we had um, several thousands of links, um, but you know it's not the, the millions of links that we need to go to the county spatial scale. So we use the thousands of link information um, to train our model. So first we run this logistic regression model that helps us determine link topology. So you can think of this as a two-stage regression because first you need to figure out if a link exists and then conditional on a link existing, we want the mass flux to follow the right statistical distribution. And so here the logistic regression is actually very important because zeros are really important to model accurately in this model because various other approaches to downscale food flow networks uh, may be based on some Kind of underlying characteristic of the county scale would just kind of more evenly distribute the mass flux and then you would get much more homogeneity in your network and you'd have a lot more uh, very highly connected network but we think that's less realistic and we think that it's important to you know accurately model the fact that there's going to be a lot of counties that aren't connected with one, one another and there's only going to really be a few counties that are going to be doing most of the transmitting so this is an important part so even though we don't expect all links to exist in our network. Accurately modeling the zeros is important, and that's where this logistic regression comes in. And then in step two, we basically take the um, supervised learning models that we develop on the FAF data and then apply them to counties. So the major, one of the major assumptions of our model 
is that the model that works well at this coarser spatial scale, the FAF spatial scale, also should hold when we move down to the county spatial resolution. So that is a big assumption, um, but we use that assumption to estimate the commodity flow potentials between counties and, um, and move down in space that way. And then we have the flow potentials. And then we apply our linear, oops, we apply our linear programming approach. Um, so here for our linear program, we use the um, flows that we do have information on. So the flows between FAF zones are going to be our mass balance constraints. So we know that we want all the counties contained in a FAF zone to add up to that FAF data. So that's one of our constraints on our linear program. Um, and then those potentials from step two, we set as our inequality constraints in our linear program. And then, like I mentioned um, earlier, we want, uh, we think it's reasonable that all else equal, counties that are closer to one another, it's going to be more economically viable for counties closer together to ship food between one another than if they're really far apart. So we minimize cost, and here we think of cost just as being a function of distance. Um, and here it is just um, Euclidean distance between county centroids. So one major um, thread of work for the future will be to improve on our distance matrices with more realistic infrastructure um, distances. But here this gives us a pretty good broad brush idea. Okay, so how is the model looking so far? So we're pretty happy with it. So here I'm going to show you some of the main kind of results or outcomes of the model. So here's a table showing the kind of FAF, some FAF kind of global network characteristics in the top and then the, some county network characteristics in the bottom. And it's broken down by SETG type. So in the FAF, we have 132 nodes compared to a little over 3,100 in the counties. Um, and then you can see importantly, so the mass column are identical between the FAF and the county. So our model is basically producing the same mass moving around the country as we saw in the FAF um, data. So that was, you know, by design, that's a model um, constraint, but it's just good to check and make sure that we actually are capturing that. And then here, the number of links um, that exist in the actual SETG data and uh, the actual FAF data compared to the number of links that we estimate to exist in county data. And then from that, you can calculate the density. And so here, the density basically tells you the number of links that exist as a fraction of the potential links. And so you can see that the FAF scale is more dense compared to the county scale, but we actually you know, think that is reasonable. That's what you'd expect, because here at the state scale, it's more likely that states are going to be much more interconnected with other states than when you get down to the county scale. We think there it's more likely to be a, uh, it's more reasonable to have a very sparse food flux network where less links exist. So our density is um, showing that we do model a sparse food flux network. And then here's some maps comparing the spatial patterns um, that exist in the FAF data with our, our model estimates. So the blue shows inflows. So you can see, um, first you can see that the color bars are different, they're not on the same spatial scale. And that is that makes sense. That's because here we're looking at inflows to an entire state or FAF zone compared to just inflows to a county. So you'd expect the uh, mass flux to, to be less when you go down to the county scale because that FAF data is being apportioned between all the counties um, contained within it. So we have about an order of magnitude less on our color bars, um, which, which makes sense, which is good. Um, but then you can also see that we're um, doing a pretty good job capturing the spatial trends that we see in the FAF data. So places like um, Illinois and the Corn Belt are locations with a lot of inflow of food and California also kind of pops up as a dark color. So they have a lot of inflows of food there. Um, the same for outflows. So again, counties are, and, and here it's um, uh, even three orders of magnitude at times less than the outflows. So um, there's more even distribution of production we're estimating in, in the county spatial scale, but then the spatial trends look, look pretty good. So again, the kind of corn belt pops up as being important and California 
and some other places um, throughout the East also pop up as being um, key places for outflows at the county spatial scale. So we're preserving those spatial trends that you see in FAF. And again, that's you know kind of by design since we have this mass balance constraint. And then here you can compare the network, um, geographical network representation of the data. So A shows the FAF data and then B is our, our modeled output. So we are capturing similar um, links and key nodes. So you see this big kind of north-south transfer of food along the Mississippi. And a lot of that is um, grain moving along the Mississippi down to the port of New Orleans and out through some ports in Texas. So that's good. So we're you know, maintaining that in the county scale database. And then also um, there's a lot of action taking place in California. And actually when we break it down by the county spatial scale, we show that counties are even more important in California, which you don't really capture when you think of California as a kind of coarse single entity. So you can see we have a lot more kind of nodes and links um, popping up in California than you do in the FAF data. And I'll explain why that makes sense here. So here, now we can compare basically some of the top links in the FAF data to our modeled output. And so here, so for example, in FAF, the largest link um, across all these food categories is going from Minnesota to Iowa. And that has a, an order to, to, to the order 10. Um, compared to, we estimate with our county scale database that the largest link is actually in California. So it's going from LA to Orange County and it's uh, an order of magnitude less. And so here, you know, at first we were a bit concerned, you know, should we have, should the largest link in our county database correspond to the largest FAF link? But actually I think, um, you know, it makes sense and actually it gives me more confidence in the model that we're not capturing that because what is, you know, our model doing? It's disaggregating the flows within those FAF zones and you're probably gonna have, or you do have more homogenous disaggregation within Minnesota and going to Iowa because there's just a lot more production and consumption spread across those two um, states compared to um, California where you have a lot more um, heterogeneity and a lot of production and also big um, cities, so big consumption hubs. Um, also the state, so just, you know, kind of a me mechanical issue is that the counties in the West are much bigger than the counties in the East and the Midwest. So you're just gonna be dividing FAF flows across bigger kind of sub entities in California in the West, which is gonna kind of automatically mean that they're gonna have bigger flows than those in places with smaller counties because you're gonna be dividing those FAF flows across uh, many more entities. But so here, you know, we can, you can see that we model a lot of action happening in California. So California counties and links um, between California counties are, are really, um, we're modeling those as being very important in our food flow network. So here, you know, it's an exciting project because this data doesn't exist and um, that makes it challenging, but then on the flip side, it makes it difficult because we don't really have anything to validate against. Um, but there was a study by Smith et al. Um, in 2017 in PNES, which does model um, corn, um, corn movement around the um, US and specifically around the, the corn belt. So this is one piece of information that we can use to compare our study with. So here, that's what we're doing. So here in A, I'm showing you basically um, we're estimating um, corn movement around the corn belt. So here you can see there's a lot in sort of the northern um, Illinois portion. So that's what our model is showing. And then we're comparing it in B with uh, mapped data from Smith et al. 2017. So that's um, a paper from PNAS where they do some, some really exciting work. And they also look at the embedded resources in, in the maze transfers. Uh, but you can see, you know, we are you know, our pictures look reasonably similar. Um, so our mass flux is actually higher than theirs slightly. So this is something we're still um, gonna dig into. We haven't quite gotten to compare um, the Smith data with the FAF data yet, but it'll be, you know, cause by design, our data is constrained to match the FAF data. So it's possible that Smith is just under um, representing um, corn movements according to FAF. So that's, that's something we need to look at. But generally we're pretty happy that our spatial trends look reasonable. And again, looking um, at inflows and outflows for the corn belts, um, comparing our study with Smith. So our study is in the top 
row and Smith's in the bottom row. So inflows, um, and these are all on the same scale, so you can compare them directly. Um, so Smith does show more heterogeneity in their inflows. And so that's something that we still have to look into and, and investigate, you know, what model differences are driving them to identify more kind of heterogeneity um, than our inflow model. But generally, you know, I think the, the spatial trends are reasonable, uh, especially for the outflows. You know, we show a lot of outflows in the sort of northern Corn Belt where there's a lot of, of maize production. So I think that makes sense. And those compare, um, you know, we're pretty happy with how that compares. And then um, finally, for comparing with them, here's some regressions. Um, so our, our study is on the x-axis and their study is on the y-axis. And so um, you can see that and the one-to-one -one line is plotted. So you can see that we are showing more outflows. So we have more mass flux in our outflow, outflows in our model. So we have to dig in and figure out, you know, what is driving that. Um, same for the inflows. Um, and then um, looking at links, though, it looks like they actually are overestimating the mass flux on specific links compared to us. So I'm going to dig in and try to figure out what model differences might be leading to some of these um, distinctions. But overall, we are pretty happy and think, given that these are two totally separate modeling approaches, um, it's you know pretty interesting that I think they're both looking reasonable compared with one another. Okay, yeah, so some immediate next steps is we need to just kind of figure out these comparisons with the Smith et al are pretty fresh, so we still haven't um, really properly digested what's driving those. Um, but, you know, it's important to remember that the Smith et al is not really, you know, empirical data. It is another model. So um, there's going to you know, be inherent differences and it's not necessarily the case that our model should perfectly line up with that model. Um, then we're in the midst of performing a sensitivity analysis. So trying to figure out, and this is challenging actually because you know, it's such a computational, computationally intensive model to begin with, trying to figure out the key input variables that are really driving our, our outcomes. Um, is taking some time to, to figure out how to do that, but that's something we want to figure out, you know, and we're finding, you know, things like distance is actually, um, you know, one of the main driving variables, um, which, which is reasonable because it's actually one of the known variables in international trade models at the global scale. Um, and then we're going to integrate all this, um, um, this food layer into the fusion visualization system. So um, Ben mentioned this um, so I highly encourage you to go check out the website, um, but this is the NSF um, project name. And there is going to be a visual visualization system that shows all the layers that we're producing. So here I've just been talking about food, but we're going to have, you know, physical water flows, water footprints, um, embodied human appropriation of that primary productivity, carbon, and a whole bunch of other exciting things. So um, next, um, is, next step is to get this um, food layer into that visualization system. Um, so again, if you're interested in some of those empirical results, you can check those out now. Those papers are already published. Um, and hopefully, um, paper three, so the, the bulk of this talk, which is in review, will will be out soon. And then, and that'd be great. To, you can check that out too. But that is pretty much all I had. So yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions. Hey everybody, so feel free to type in a question into that questions chat box and then we'll read it out loud for Megan to answer. So here's a question from Mick. Um, did you use county level food production data to constrain the model? Yes, so that is a regressor in our machine learning algorithm. So it, I'm not sure it's a constraint, but it is a regressor in the supervised learning algorithm. And that is definitely an important variable for some of the food categories like the grains and the animal feed. Um, so it was less important for, um, there's also, you know, processed food 
that we're modeling. So things, uh, there's a processed food category that includes thing, everything from frozen pizza to you know canned tuna. So that um, was not an important regressor variable for that SETG commodity class, but it definitely was used for the more raw agricultural commodities. Yeah, but thanks, good question. We'll give it another few minutes for questions. People think about it and type it in. All right, this is from Joe Kreener. Um, I connected it late, so please pardon if this is already discussed. What sort of cal calibration targets did you use for this model? Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm understanding your question, but we used machine learning um, and trained it on existing FAF scale data. So we do have food flow information at that at a core spatial scale from the government. And we um, train our model on that, on half of that, make sure that it validates well against the half that we did not train it on. And then we apply that model to the county spatial scale. So hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. All right, next one. Yep, he said answered sharply, thanks. Oh, um, next question is from Tim. Have you made any preliminary analyses of the water mass that is being transferred from one county to another based on the water needed to grow a crop? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of work. Um, so the team is very interested in water. So there's a lot of people working on water on the team. Um, I've done some work um, on water footprinting in the US. So there is a paper out um, called High Resolution Water Footprints of Production in the US which you can check out that was in water resources research last year, uh, 2018. So there we, we did um, uh, with, with Land and Marston, we worked to basically figure out the water requirements for not just food, but for all sectors of the US economy. Um, and other members of the team have also been doing a lot of work on this. Um, ben Ruddle and Richard Rushforth have also done similar work trying to look at the, the water footprint of the US economy. Um, so there's a lot of water footprinting work. And then in particular, um, so Tara Troy, um, who will be talking in a couple weeks in this webinar, is going to talk about her work to look at physical water transfers from um, between counties and also identify, you know, if those count, if those waters are, if the that water is being used for um, agriculture or energy and kind of attribute uh, when it's withdrawn, what it's withdrawn for. So yeah, a lot of work kind of actively ongoing in the team. All right, the next question is, what are the downscaling assumptions that you mentioned previously, particularly with the pairs? If we were to perform similar downscaling, are there other assumptions you considered that might be worth looking into? Um, so I think the, well, the main downscaling assumption is that the machine learning algorithm that we train on the FAF data. So, you know, what is that doing? It's giving us a gamma mixture hurdle model regression on trained on the FAF data. And then we assume that the regressors that are important um, at the FAF spatial scale are also the key regressors at the county spatial scale. So it's going to be things like you know, we identify basically the functional form that best fits um, grain transfers at the fast spatial scale. So it's going to be things like, you know, the grain production, um, livestock population maps, because a lot of times you're going to have grain production moving to livestock um, areas. Um, so other variables like that, which we'll identify as being important at the fast spatial scale, then we assume that those regressors and the functional fit also is valid at the county spatial scale. So that's the main downscaling assumption um, that we use. So hopefully that, that answers your questions. And other assumptions, um, 
So, you know, then the other approaches we use are mass balance, which I think is, you know, pretty valid and not that questionable. Um, we also assume that the network properties would follow the statistical distributions that we see in other empirical proper in other empirical networks. Um, so that's that's one assumption. Um, but since we have a lot of empirical evidence supporting that, I think that is also fairly valid. Um, the other one would be, um, you know, our linear programming. We're um, trying to minimize cost, um, cost defined as the shortest distance between pairs. So, you know, there's, um, it's possible that there's other linear programs that we could try. Um, Smith et al. Um, so the study that we compared to, they also do run a linear program where they minimize distance. Um, so um, I think it's pretty valid, but yeah, going forward, it would be good if we could get actual cost to transport between counties because it's possible that counties can be closer together, um, but they, it actually might be more expensive to ship between those two counties. So getting some more realism in the cost to ship commodities between counties would help there. But right now we're just assuming that distance gives us our, um, our relationship of cost. So hopefully that answers your questions. Thanks, good questions. All right, the next question is, what distance relationship did you use, for example, inverse? Did you consider other relationships like inverse squared? Um, yes, we do use inverse squared um, because we're, we're um, using the gravity model distance um, relationship in our regressions. So the gravity model says that two trading partners should be are more likely, or the mass traded between two trading partners is going to be proportional to the economic mass of those two entities um, divided by the square root of distance between those two entities. So we also use that in our, in our regressions. All right, any more questions? Give another minute. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, ben, do you have any else, anything to say to close out the webinar? Uh, just thank you everybody for coming and for the questions. Thank you, Megan, for the talk. It's really good work, and um, I'm hopeful that this work and, and others of the project are going to lay down a really good baseline for our understanding of this system in the United States. So um, pay attention for updates. Um, check out the website, and there's going to be a lot of interesting developments from the project over the next year, including the release of this good work. Um, thanks, everybody. And to add on that, um, please tune in next week on February 20th at the same time for Landon Marson from uh, Kansas State University. He'll be talking about water footprint benchmarks for the United States. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening.